So how does this historical process after Reconstruction play out? The new rulers of the South after 1876, 1877, called themselves the Redeemers. This is a political term like carpetbagger, like scalawag. It's a, lab a self-described label. It has a quasi-religious tone to it. The people, the redeemers, the people who redeemed or saved the South from reconstruction, from carpetbaggers, and from what they called black supremacy. Now, the sort of classic work on them long ago by the great historian C. Van Woodward, Origins of the New South, made the point that the redeemers were, although they talked about restoring the Old South, actually that's not what they were doing in many ways. They were much more business oriented, they were much more interested in economic development, they did not just want to go back to the old agrarian society. These governments did try to get rid of many of the policies of Reconstruction governments, particularly they cut government expenditures to the bone, um, particularly education, which was one of the main achievements of Reconstruction. Spending on education was cut almost to nothing in the South. Um, I think in my book I quote the statistic that Louisiana was the only place in the civilized world where illiteracy actually grew from 1865, uh, 1877 to 1900 because of the decimation of education uh, and other social services. But as I say, it was not just a return to the pre-Civil War period um, for two reasons. One, they were not purely agrarian in their outlook, the Redeemers, and two, race relations remained somewhat indeterminate. It took another generation for this new system to be fully um, put into place. Um, African Americans continued to vote in many parts of the South, particularly in the Upper South. Um, in some places we had what uh, I've referred to as a long Reconstruction, remember? Or almost a second Reconstruction within the South. In 1879, a coalition of Republicans and what they called readjusters, these were Democrats who it all had to do with questions about the state debt, I don't want to go into, but the readjusters and the Republicans took over the state of Virginia from the Democrats for four years uh, and actually had another reconstruction with, with much more money for education, more local autonomy for the black areas, etc. Same thing happened in the 1890s in uh, North Carolina. From, 18, uh, from 1894 to 1898, a coalition reminiscent of reconstruction of African-American voters in the eastern part of the state and populists, small farmers in the western part, ousted the Democrats from control of North Carolina. And for four years, um, four years uh, they had their own reconstruction there. Um, blacks continued to be elected to some offices in the South, local, national. The last African-American congressman of the long Reconstruction era was George White, who served in North Carolina and left office in 1901. He was the last black congressman. So as of 1901, Congress was all white, Cong the House and the Senate. The next African-American congressman was Oscar de Priest, elected in the 1920s from Chicago not from the South. By then, a significant black migration was taking place from South to North. And they, uh, one of these questions of historical detail or trivia, the, who was the first African-American person elected to Congress from a Confederate state after George White left in 1901? That took until 1968, when Barbara Jordan was elected to the House of Representatives from Texas. So from 19... To 1968, there was no African American representation in Congress from the states of the old Confederacy. So, as I said, these so things take a while to com the, complete. The black politics takes a while to completely be eliminated in the South. Uh, as I said, the new the the Redeemers pushed this idea of a new South. This was propagated particularly by Henry Grady, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, a major southern newspaper. 
The South, he said, cannot go back to the old plantation system. Uh, we need to follow in the economic footsteps of the North. We have to develop industry. We have to diversify the economy. We've got to get rid of the old anti-urban frame of mind from, um, from the, from the pre-Civil War era. Regional industrialization was the goal, railroad development. Not in a weird way all that different from what some of the Reconstruction governments were trying to promote. But the problem was that this New South ideology failed um, to, in one key element, and that was it would not actually attack the plantation system. To have real economic development, you needed to break up the plantations, you needed to free up labor for other kinds of jobs, you needed to end dependence on the one crop system of cotton. To do that, you needed to change the credit system. In other words, there were all these built-in problems in the, in the South based on the dominance of the plantation and of cotton, which the New South uh, ideologues failed to uh, address. And therefore, the New South ideology failed. The South remained locked into this one crop economy by and large, economically, in, increasingly economically dependent on the North, and by the 20th century, the, South, the New South, the so-called New South, was just a landscape of poverty and economic dependency. By the 1930s, President Roosevelt in the Depression would say, the South is the country's number one economic problem. So from being the richest, having the richest people in the country before the Civil War, the South was now a dependent, uh, uh, very poor area, and, uh, and, of, and of course the poverty affected black and white Southerners, although being at the very bottom of the ladder, African Americans suffered more than anyone else. The, planta the planters did survive, most of them. They held on to their land, even though they were now no longer a major power in national politics as before the Civil War. Uh, some see in the 1880s, 1890s, a kind of merger of the old planter class and this rising merchant group. Planters increasingly, or a kind of merger into a new planter merchant class or whatever you want to call them. Planters increasingly went into the business of supplying their sharecroppers, their tenants with goods. They set up their own merchant academies. Merchants used their profits to purchase land. Um, the loser in this economic situation was the agricultural laborer, the sharecropper, both black and white. As I said before, there were always more white sharecroppers in the South from 18, between 1880 and 1940 than black, although the percentage of blacks was much higher. Um, why didn't African Americans just leave the South? Jobs were, ex the real economic growth in the country, as we saw last time, was in the North the second industrial revolution. This was where factories were expanding, where every kind of economic enterprise was expanding. There was a little bit of migration in 1879. There was the so-called Kansas exodus where some number of African Americans, particularly from Mississippi, Tennessee, moved out to Kansas to uh, try to find greater opportunity. By the 1890s, there was the beginning of a movement from the South into Northern cities but in 1900, 90% of the black population still lived in the South. Most, they had not really moved. Uh, why? The reason is that no job opportunities were available in the North. In other words, as before the Civil War, the North was complicitous in the economic system that had been established in the South. As I said, there was this giant need for labor in the North. Where did they go to get, who, was, who were the workers in the factories of Pittsburgh and Cleveland and the stockyards of Chicago, et cetera? They were immigrants, right. The northern industry went 4,000 miles east, 5,000 miles east, to get workers from Greece, from Poland, from Italy, from the Russian, uh, the Tsarist Empire. They would not go 800 miles south to bring up workers from Mississippi or Alabama. The color line in employment in the North made it impossible for African Americans to move because there were simply no jobs available for blacks in the burgeoning parts of the Northern economy. How do we know this? 
When did black migration from the South begin in earnest, in large numbers, the, what we call the Great Migration? That started in 1914. What happened in 1914? The outbreak of World War I in Europe, which cut off immigration from Europe. And then that cutoff was made permanent, at least for a while, by the Immigration Act of 1924, which tried to eliminate I I I immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Unable to get immigrant labor anymore, northern factories and employers began opening up jobs in, at the lowest levels of industrial employment to blacks in the South. And that's when the mass migration of African Americans begin. By, not, by 1950, a major, or the 60, a majority of the African American population lives outside the South for the first time in American history. But in the period up to 1914, they're locked into the South because of the lack of employment opportunities uh, anywhere else.